this one? No, I don't. You see? Do you think I'm in a 917, do you? It wasn't actually. That was me in that Ferrari. And that was my first ever sports car race of my life, in number 23. That was you, your first ever sports car race? Yeah, my first ever sports car race. That was far. And uh, I then went on to drive for the factory at Le Mans a month later. And then a year later, I was driving them. <laughs> so I'm getting an education. Well, you are. So don't go around saying Derek Bell was driving that. Because I would say, actually, he wasn't. You see the trash you find on the internet, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it, it actually, I don't think it is. I think it, they think it is, but there aren't houses both sides. I think it's down a place called Burnerville, which is, he went up to the top and then he started to go down on the old track. But I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> ah, just a couple of each. <laughs> So Derek, what's the uh, what's the worst car you've driven? What's the worst top level car you've driven? Um, the, the Techno Formula One, probably the rightly bad cars now. The Techno Formula One, which I drive from time to time, you know, historic event. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I was going to ask you. What cars do you want to? That was one of the best cars of my life. That, that one. That made my career. That car. Tell me about it. <laughs> well, it's the Brabham BT30. I still drive it. That car is immaculate in England with still my name on it. Perfect condition. Um, I, I have driven it at Goodwood. The guy doesn't bring it much there. We were bringing it over here for that, that thing there, for the Amelia Island when I was honoree last year, but he eventually didn't bring it. He didn't want it damaged. But it's beautiful. BT30. And I was the top driver in Europe that year. <laughs> so that is... It still works. That is recently at Goodwood, isn't it? In a Ferrari, something or other. <laughs> so, like he said, what do you... That was, up, that was up the hill and the guy said, would I do it in the race? And, you know, in September at the Revival, I said no. I don't like having my head stuck out over the top. And I drive this all the time. Yeah. So, like he said, what you, what's your favorite cars you own and to, and to drive? What, did somebody ask me that? Yeah, he did. He said daily drive. I'm just I curious. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Um, I don't mean that. I'm just not a fan of Mercedes. It's, it's funny, you know, some of us, I mean, I can take loaded drivers, love Mercedes, racing drivers. They don't do much. Thank I, you. I left a car that's sporty. And um, I work with Bentley now on a worldwide basis. So, um, I guess I, 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 have a, I have a Bentley GT in England, which I use all the time. Um, and then I got a couple. I got a 550 Maranello and a, and a special Porsche in the garage, which is quite a 550 they built. And I have those two in my garage, and then uh, and I also drive a few other little bits in England. But um, if I'm saving fuel, I drive my Audi A2 with uh, 70 miles per gallon. Or else, um, my wife's car. And then in America, I drive um, uh, Carrera, uh, Carrera S. Because I actually have a Porsche dealership in Naples, oh, and a Bentley dealership. I'm part of it. I don't know. I'm, I'm an investor in it, or part owner. And I love that. And uh, so I, I, I drive a Porsche, which is a new, you know, new sort of um, you know, era of Porsche, a very, you know, with all the electronics and things. Um, whereas the you know, 1970 cars were quite exciting to drive. And I didn't. I wasn't really that enthused about driving. And I raced all the time, frightened myself to death. I never actually did fright myself, but I didn't need to be frightened on the road. I, so I never bought a 911, although I had one or two over the period. But um, I always went for the 928 type car if I could. So I wanted to drive peacefully across Europe and often spend my time on the other Do you get frustrated with other drivers on the road? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't. I drive fast, but I don't drive stupidly. But um, I do get frustrated because you're lucky. You live with, up here with what you, you probably don't think is a driver. But you want to go to Florida, and they are the worst. <laughs> and then they get so bad. I don't know where they come from. Whoever taught them. But I think it's the American your driving system that you you don't teach, you don't get taught properly. I mean, in England we have to have lessons, and then when we take the test, I mean. Yeah, they make. I mean, they put you. They put you up with a with a with a clutch, not with a automatic. They stick you on a bridge, and they used to put one of those old matchboxes behind the wheel. They make you stop. The instructor get out for your test. This was put this matchbox, which was made of the lightest little wood you know you've ever had, 
to put it behind the wheel, and they say, okay, on we go, shut the door, get in, and then I roll back across the box into my seat. I mean, you really, I know, right, you say, what's the good of that when you're driving on I-95, but you really were taught all about, you know, overtaking, and people have no concept in Florida particularly. Uh, and then you then you learn the hard way, and then you all have instincts, and then gradually you become better drivers. But you do. I mean, there's some bloody good drivers here, so don't. I'm not naming everybody, but I think if you're given the right basis, it's 16 to 17 how to drive. I mean, I went and did my test in Florida, and I answered 40 questions. Yeah, seriously. I mean, I did. I answered two lots of 20 questions. Okay, I got two lots of 20. I took my license two years ago again because I had to with my green card. They give me 20 questions each. If you get more, and, and three or four of the questions are about what happened, you know, what do you get to be drunk in charge under the, under the influence? How many points do you get? I don't know. Does it matter how many light points I get? I mean, I shouldn't be drunk in charge, so what a stupid question. How's it going to make me a better driver knowing how many points I get? You know, so that's one of the questions, or two or three of them. What's the fine, or so on and so forth. And, and then you go and get in the car, and you drive around with a chap, and they drive around the back of public supermarket in the parking lot. Never went more than 20 miles an hour. And uh, had to you know, do this parallel parking, as we call it, and come to an offset road junction in the parking lot. There's no road marks. He said, just imagine that there's a white line over there. You've got to make that left and right turn. What do you do? And I go, well, I just look out for other traffic and I make my move when the road is clear. You know, but it never happens on the road because there's always lines and all sides. And then he said, okay, so you can't. So, I mean, how does that train me to go, a young kid like him, how the hell does it train him to go out and you can go straight on 95 and Dad's giving him a bloody Mustang, an old Mustang, which will still do 120 miles an hour. He goes out like a if you take a test, you really want, you know, you still need to go and learn how. I mean, the best thing is, I mean, in a way, is to go and drive a go kart. Because if you drive a go kart, at least you know about the field. Yeah, the 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 sure. I mean, people say, oh, I don't want to be a racer. I'm actually making a racing driver. But it gives you a driving experience that you're not going to get. People go out on the road. You know? I, mean, I see them on Porsche driving days, because I used to run the Porsche driving days for the whole of Porsche in America, all over the country. And um, you get these people out there, they're all so nervous. And people, oh, I'm not, oh, I'm not a very good driver, or this. And you get with guys, and they were brilliant drivers, but they had no idea they were brilliant. Because nobody says to you a great driver. They say you're a crap driver. <laughs> but I mean, there's probably only the wife that will tell you that. And um, <laughs> they say, you know, slow down. That's right, you know, we are. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I just think that, you know, you really need to get your basis of your driving right and, and understand that. And the only way, look, everybody else out there is an idiot. When you come diving from lane to lane to you in Florida, just remember that what happens if somebody else does the same? Don't imagine that all those cars you're running are going to stay where they are. Because they won't. Somebody will make a loop if you come diving. I mean, I promise you. It's just a lunacy. So if you're naked, you get to go to Thailand again? I've been, I was there the other day. I was a guest speaker there a month ago. Very interesting. Where do you spend most of your time? There. Yes. I mean, in Florida. Yeah, I'm going to England. No, I live in Boca. I go across the dealership every week. Where does Redmond live down there? He lives in Vero Beach. I never see him. He stays He's 100 miles north of me. It's funny, we never... The girl put this to me. And he comes to my house every month and so I sign lots of pictures and books with him which he sells on his website. Yeah, when I saw him two years ago, he was driving like Mazda 6. He still is. He still is. The old white Mazda. He comes round to my house, and he's round two weeks ago. He comes round, dear old Vic, hey Derek, can I come round? I said, Vic, any time, you know. Come with I have an espresso machine, and he loves my Lavazza machine, so we give him that. He sits down, and, he, and we say, can you help me? And I go out in his car, and bloody boxes of books and pictures and all this sort of thing. I mean, it never ends, you know, which he then sells on the internet. I don't like that. I say, well, you know, that could be me if I wasn't so lucky. And, um, you know, and, and, and he, um, so, and he got, and they go to take the stuff back actually to the car normally, and, and they go, and his car is this white old mass. I don't know if it's a Mac, it looks like a Ford Escort, but anyway, yeah. it probably is a Mac. And it, it's thick, I mean, he lifts up the trunk, and all the gullies are full with leaves. I mean, it's, it's full of leaves, like he never goes to the boot trunk or whatever. And it's covered in bird shit, and leaves, and marks are all the leaves that mark the roof. He's, he's amazing, really. You know, but I guess the poor bloke does have a tough time. Life's tough on him. But he seems very happy. I think the fact he's been so ill 
you know, he had cancer and prostate problems as well. So I think now he's had heart problems. And I, think he's, I think he's so relieved he's still alive and feeling good that um, I think the rest of the world, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day if you're well, it doesn't matter what car you drive. Who, who is this we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Which is sad, you know, when the guy did so much. He was so damn good. I mean, he was one of the toughest drivers out there. And it was just when I started that he almost finished. And when he was in that 917, he was, I would say Vic was the one guy I didn't want to come up against. I know it was my first year, in, really, in did four races in the Ferraris the year before, with Porsche, which was a tough old car. I mean, you have to step up Rodriguez as a team in the, two, in the two cars. You know that, you know, life's not easy. And, um, you know, and you'd be up and then you'd have to go and compete against Vic. And of course, they would push things around, the other two, or try to. Um, but, I mean, he was very hard, very tough one. The whole what did you do before you turned pro? Did you do Yeah, I was pro in like all three. So I did, I did Lotus 7, Formula 3, and I did three races in Formula 2 and went to Ferrari. Yeah. Actually, I did, it was my fourth year. Where did they see you at there? Lotus 7, Formula 3, Formula 3, and then Harvard Formula 2. Where did they first see you at? Um, I don't know. Um, let me think. Um, um, let me think. Formula 3, I guess, my second. I mean, I won my first race in my life on a Lotus 7, so I said that was a good start, but never would notice that. And then I went and I had a tough year in Formula 3 in a poor car because we didn't have any money, we didn't know what to do. And on hindsight, I, you know, it's never given me and my stepfather advice, and we bought the car and we did it all, and we built our own engines and we stupid things. At the end of the day, I think that's where CJ had gone and bought a good car and we'd have saved money. You know, we all know we can't spend that, we can't spend that, we didn't. And then, of course, you get caught up in enthusiasm, which I'm sure you guys do. Oh, shit, you know, I've, I've got to go and do that. I need those new wheels or I need those new modified brakes. And so you buy them. If you bought the bloody brand new car in the first place, you'd have been a lot better off. And, um, and then, I, then I went up to, then I went to the sort of, then I really got to F3 and went to a our own team, if you like, we had three cars, and we got back down the road, like, I'm going to and saying, I can't bother, let's buy three cars. Oh, yeah, okay, we got the truck, we got a small workshop, let's do it. And I won eight Formula 3 races in my first, really in my first real proper year. And um, I think nowadays, if you won eight races, you'd be straight to Formula 1, in Formula 3. And in those days, of course, you weren't, because you still had to pay your dues and go to Formula 2. But people were obviously watching, and, um, I was uh, 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 some great ice and At the time, I, I wanted to win nine, not eight, you know, so I wasn't satisfied. And then the next, then, so it's like, what do you do after you've won eight races? You've got to progress into another point, you can't get there. And so, uh, you know, I said to my stepfather, I said, uh, that's just what we nicknamed him. I said, we've got to go up to Formula 2, I can't stand at three if I'm going to go anyway. So, well, there you are, there's the car. You know, there's two engines and you're on your own. And uh, so we said, well, uh, and then I looked around and looked at the sponsor, first year sponsor, 68, first year of sponsorship. And of course, you know, we wrote to people, please, will you help finance my racing? They go, funny, they didn't reply, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and but you're young and stupid, I think everybody's going to help you. And, um, in fact, it's all in my book. No, I wish you would send it And um, so I. We eventually we went to the bank and we went to come go to the bank and we'll see if they'll loan us some money. So we, went, we had we had a farm, so we had lots of collateral. So we went to the bank and they loaned us ten thousand pounds. And we went off racing and I came third in my first race behind Jackie Stewart um, and somebody else who was world champion the next year. Who was, so Jackie was in Formula One by now. So I, I, I came third behind Jackie and Jochen Rindt, who was quite a good driver. And uh, they thought, hello, this bloke's obviously okay. And then I then went to Germany the day Jimmy Clark died. I was in that race, which is tragic. Uh, I was fourth there in crap qualifying. I didn't finish the race. And then um, I got a phone call from Ferrari. Uh, and then at the same time as Ferrari, within a week, I got a phone call from Cooper, which is where Ludwig Elfer was driving for. But I drive that Formula One car, so I had the situation: did I go and drive for Cooper in Formula One, in what I considered to be a disappointingly lousy, horrible car, or did I go to Ferrari for Formula Two, which obviously had Formula One in the next room? If I did well enough, I'd probably slip into a Formula One car. And so I, had lots of toing and froing. I literally tested in Modena, 
you know, at Monza actually. Is that right? I tested at Monza, and then I met the old man at the factory the next day, and then I flew back that night and tested at Silverstone the next day in the Formula One Cooper, and uh, drove that, and then of course, and then Ferrari's saying the new site for us, and Cooper's saying the new site for no, but we did have managers in those days, it was me, age 26, going, what do I do? And I, I really didn't know what to do. I mean, in hindsight, I did the right thing, but I wish I had somebody helping me. I mean, I didn't think of it, but I needed somebody. Because, I mean, in those days, as you grew up, you did everything on your own. You did, you did that big thing, I should do this old boy, but it's going to cost you 20%, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, ultimately, and then I had the head of Cooper on, not John Cooper himself, but I had his financial guy saying, you know, come on, we need a, we need a decision. And I went to discuss the contract. I thought, well, I'll find out what it's about. And um, the money was nothing. I mean, they offered five pounds. It's a nominal amount, which is fifteen dollars to sign the contract. It was about Formula One, and that, uh, to me, the car was crap anyway. And, um, so I, but I, and I drove it again, and I was quite good in it, I guess. And uh, I, then I, I, I got a drive. How can you not want to drive a Ferrari? But Ferrari is beyond my dreams. I mean, imagination of driving a Ferrari. So I went, to, I went out to Italy, and they put me on my first race. I did, I did some testing, I suppose, somewhere at Marinello, a modern at the test track, and then I went to my first race with Monza. And um, I hadn't signed, they wanted me to sign my contract, and they wouldn't, because I'd heard all about Ferrari kills his drivers and the cruel sport, and all these pictures in the newspaper of blood and guts and people dying. And all, I mean, you know, that year, um, uh, Sandini had been killed at, Modena, at, at, Mon at Monaco in the Grand Prix, and all lit in cars. And, you know, I get pressure from my family not to do it. You know, and literally, my mother said, if you sign for Ferrari, you'll never come in this time again. <laughs> when I had that pressure. <laughs> you know, um, and, and those sort of things. But I, you know, it was my dream you know, to race cars. And I wasn't a hard knuckled person, though. I just, you know, you get led, don't you, by, your, by what you want to do. And uh, so I, as I said, I went and did my first race and then had a bloody great, I run pole position. Which is what a mom's doing in your first race, you're a bit of a hero. So who is this cloak in a Ferrari? You know, there were four Ferraris in the race, and I was quicker than all of them. And um, I, led, I led the race for a while, but because it was a slipstreaming race um, around the old Monza circuit, not the bank circuit, but um, the Ferrari didn't have a, a good mid range power. It wouldn't pull out the cloak, not the torque of the Ford, possibly. And it just wouldn't pull as it came out. It was alright when I could wind up and tip my, get the perfect line on my own, but as soon as I got with traffic, you have to back off, go down the inside, go down the outside. And then when I came out, the corner said all the talk of the concert would go away. So I was running, I was running Pentagon or something like that in a group, only because suddenly I got hit by something. I think that I, I think the gearbox seized myself. But suddenly I went round like that. No reason we were sure of rest from parabolic no reason for anything to go wrong. And uh, I, I never, I wasn't in the habit of crashing, and I never used to crash, never did. But, and I flicked, flicked me around, I took out three Ferraris and my own Brabham that was in the race with somebody else. And it, that was it, so I went home and I thought, well, that's it. I'll never, I'll never send a contract to me now. I mean, you know, I just stuffed three Ferraris. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you have been, you have made some, you made some pretty dumb decisions in your life, Derek, and that was one of them. So I went home, my wife was in hospital, very, very ill. And, uh, and she said, and I thought, God, I hope she doesn't know about it. When I walked in, she said, I saw it on TV, and they had it on the 9 o'clock news on a Sunday night. British driver in Ferrari had a month of crash, bloody flames beeping up the one guy. She went, oh, great. And I thought, well, that's it. My wife was in there with them. With, 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 any, any person in hospital, any nervous thing makes it work. And so that's when I got the pressure from the wife. My mother said, that's it. And so, uh, then I, I thought, well, that was it. And three days later, I get a phone call um, from Shell in London saying that Ferrari contacts and want me to go to Modern and sign my contract. So I went out to Italy. I didn't take much time to sign the contract that time, I can assure you. <laughs> so I did it, and there was the contract. And as I was signing it, the head of the local doctor, G O D D I, he was like a piece of Ferrari's right hand man in charge of motorsports. And he said to me, he said, uh, well, El, El Comandatorio is so impressed with your drive at Monza, in practice qualifying. He said, here's a check, and I got a check for $1,000 for, for, um, for my incredible task that I've been qualifying. And so that was that. And then he, um, but I, I mean, if you want to know, I got paid £500 for a Grand Prix, which is like 1250 bucks for a Grand Prix. And I got about um, six, $700 for a... Uh, for former two race. Now they get half a million dollars a race.
tent I still work. <laughs> so it was a wonderful experience. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. I mean, Ken Cyril said it ruined my career. It was the only career. Drive, driving a Ferrari would be a mistake. And in fact, that's what John Wire said. Uh, he he said the first year at Ferrari. I don't remember it. But um, I joined them in June, late June. Um, and I, and Ferrari signed me up, and I got a call from John Wire, who ran the GT40s, the Gulf GT40s. And he said, well, I, at this point, I'd never driven a sports car, but I was British, and John was British, and I guess they saw that I had a certain amount of ability, and worth giving me a shot. So John um, sent me, I, I, he phoned me, when I come and test. So I have a, so I, um, so I went to Brooklyn for a test in a brand new GT40 with uh, windows on the side that hasn't been completed. It's a race car, and John Wise said we want you to do the model. It's the model in September that year, always in June, but September in 1968, September because it's due to riots in Paris in June. And um, so I got my colleague at the time to mention the Ferrari. So I sent an email. I phoned up. Well, I sent a telex somehow because we didn't have email. And so I, somehow I told Ferrari that I wanted to drive at the mall, and I got this email back, uh, fax back saying, you know, honor your contract. We said I can't drive anymore. So I didn't drive the GT40, but I was going to drive with Rodriguez, but of course he went on with a pleasure he did hire and won the Lamar 24. That could have been my first win. And, um, and of course I then went back and drove for them two years later, and I said we used to be the same guy, just so Joe and Henry. And, um, and that was my beginning with Ferrari. But it was a great experience. I wouldn't have missed it. I mean, you know, I drove for Porsche, I drove for Porsche, I drove for Ferrari, I drove for Ferrari, I drove for Ferrari, I drove for Ferrari, I drove for not on contract, but I did spend a lot of time with him. Every morning I was there at the factory, he was, I'd get called into his office. I'd go into his office. Jay Stanley! You I'll, are the winner of the SP Motorsports. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Check that out. <laughs> Check that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, sorry, where were we? Where you were in his office. Oh, yeah, and every morning I'd get called into his office. And you go and sort of, that was in the early days, of course, my wife was still ill, and he knew it. And the, the Italians are very, very pro family. And um, he kept, every morning he'd say, How's your wife today? I said, I don't know, you know, it's only 8 o'clock in the morning in England. It's one hour time difference. So he said, We'll call up the hospital. And he was personally quite the hospital. I mean, he's amazing, man. For me, I had such an amazing experience with him. I, you know, at the same time, I. I never rated myself very high as a driver. I thought I was okay. And um, so, and his attitude to me was so much of nurturing me, they could bring me on to be a good driver with my team. Never once was I told to speed up a bit. I mean, it's all like, okay, okay you know, calm down. And then we just want to go back with a good report to be on and go to central race like the United States Grand Prix. So I did that. Right? So, you know, we just want to go back and say, you know, we did a good job. And, um, I had no idea how what input he took in it, but obviously he did love racing. I, I got a picture of me and him and so on. He never came to the race. But we'd always have lunch with him. If we're racing at Monza, we'd always have lunch with him the day before practice. Uh, at Cavalina? No, no, we'd go down to... I know, I, I've been there a lot. I mean, this is what it was. It's Santa Astorgia, just yeah. the restaurant. And um, we'd go there and he had his own room and he would have 10 or 12. Plus a journal, you know, typically Italian bun time. And, um, you know, the old man loved that. He had that. He never sort of, you know, he always looked like he was pushing up with everybody because he had to. But when I went out with him, we had a very relaxed time. But I had to speak French with him. Okay, we got the grand prize. I don't think that's good. I don't think that's good. Good for $600 of labor.